So one, um, hello and welcome um, for those of us that are here to the Rails Coal Valley Service Center. Um, I'm Kate Hall, president of the Rails Board, um, and I call this meeting to order on Friday, September 22nd at 1.01 p.m. Emily, will you please call roll? Sure. Christine Barr. Here. Dave Berry. Sue Busenbark. Here. Judy Cracker. I don't see anyone on Gwen there. Gwen Gregory. Here. Kate Hall. Here. Paul Mills. Here. Scott Poynton. Here. Dee Runnels. Nadia Sheik. Here. Michelle Simmons. Joe Skabinski. Laura Turner. Lori Wilcox. Harriet Zipfel. Here. We have a quorum. I'll just barely. All right. Um, moving on to recognition of guests, let's start here in Coal Valley. And Jane, would you start? Sure. Jane Plass, Rails. Okay. An Angela Campbell, Rock Island. Barbara Love, Kiwani. Mary Witt Rails. Joe Philippek Rails. Veronica Pitchford Rails. Wesley Smith Rails. Jim Krieger Rails. Amanda Bafasio Rails. Emily Feister Rails. Sharon Swanson Rails. All right. And um, Bolingbrook? Ann Slaughter Rails. Ann Slaughter. <laughs> and East Peoria? I see Kendall. Hello, I am here. I am the only one at the moment. <laughs> Kendall Morris, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. Thanks, Kendall. Um, and Rockford? Amber Hickey Rails. Thanks, Amber. And Vernon? It looks empty. Um, and the Illinois State Library? Good afternoon, Deborah Eggert. Karen Egan? Gwen Harrison. <laughs> and Galesburg. It also looks like there is no one there. And last, Quincy. I don't see anyone there as well. All right. Um, do we have any public comments here in Coal Valley? All right. Do um, we have any public comments at any of our other sites. All right, then if I could have a motion and a second for the adoption of the agenda. So moved. I'll second. Thanks, Scott. Thanks, Harriet. Um, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? <laughs> motion carries. Moving on to the approval of the Rails Board Minutes of August 25th, 2017. May I have a motion for the approval of the minutes? So moved. Thanks, Sue. And a second? Did I anyone? Second? I wasn't there, so I don't feel like I can. Technically, I'll second you can. It. Nadia Shake. Oh. Thanks, Nadia. Perfect. Um, any discussion on the minutes? I have a clarification. Great. Uh, under the uh, consortia committee report, it's uh, the last sentence notes that I'm working on a document to clarify those questions. I'd like to clarify that the document is specific to the overlay. Um, and in fact, it's the draft that you received this week in, in your email. Um, the broader questions about resource sharing will be addressed at the Rails member update on October 5th. Um, would you like to modify that it just says is working on a document to clarify questions concerning the overlay project? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Um, Sue and Nadia, are you okay with that modification? Yes. Yes. Great. Um, so all those in favor, please say aye. Uh, aye. 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 Any opposed? And the motion carries. Um, 
Next up, we have the Rails Financial Report. Um, Jim, do you think you could come around by Sue so we can see your smiling face? <laughs> so it doesn't sound like a disembodied voice from above. <laughs> be right by the microphone also <laughs> that may have had something to do okay um, this is the financial report for the month ending uh, August um, um, August 31st hope that wasn't me okay um, now there isn't too much to report we're not too far into the year only two months uh, so that trends uh, versus budget aren't too meaningful yet um, but at the end of August, we did have uh, 11.7 million in cash and investments in the general fund, and it's still slightly over a year's coverage. And this is despite not having received our nearly four million dollars yet from our um, our grant of last year. So we're still hopeful we will get that in soon, but we haven't yet. But we've survived without it um, through. Uh, Probably the most notable uh, thing, uh, <clears throat> through August, our expenditures are 191304 under budget. About 95000 of that are personnel expense expenditures, 9.7% uh, of below budget, and 57000 of that were salaries. Some of that will dissipate when we give our raise, our 3% uh, budgeted raises, which we haven't done yet. but. That'll still leave about a 6% variance, so that part will stick uh, as we go through the year. Um, our, um, our fund balance, the general fund balance through August had a deficiency of revenues over expenditures of just over 1.1 million, and that is, and has declined to just uh, below 12 million. Um, our capital projects uh, funds expenditures, we made a payment of 377815 which covered uh, both July and August uh, expenditures. We'll have one more payment to do. The, uh, we passed our final inspection this week, and so the project is almost finished and will be completed during this month. Can I answer any questions? Just as a point of clarification, if I recall from last month that the raises have not been allocated yet because we had not yet received approval for our plan of I forgot to mention that service we from received state, our approval correct? good lead in <laughs> yes we just got our approval uh, this um, this week a day or two ago of the fiscal year 2018 uh, plan of service which includes the budget just exciting all right great any questions for Jim here in Coal Valley Hey, Jim, uh, <clears throat> this is Scott Poynton. On the sort of page three of your report, uh, down in the center of the page is the one, two, three, fourth item down, U.S. Treasury, E-bond. And then the next column, account purpose type, says donation, P. Swarsky. What? Oh, that was that was before your time. Yeah. <laughs> we, we received a, an inheritance, or, or, uh, well, a leg, yeah, from a, a will. A donation from a will, uh, which was about half of a uh, of, uh, U.S. savings bond and half cash, so it was almost fifty thousand total. Okay. And uh, we have left the um, the U.S. bonds uh, intact as they were carrying an interest interest rate of four percent. Sure. And we had uh, talked about uh, designating them uh, to using those funds as part to uh, to fund the overlay project if that happens oh. but we hadn't found a real good use for it yet uh, that would be consistent with the person's uh, wishes and backgrounds okay thank you so that is why we have a series of yes. okay. u.s savings bonds in the portfolio she, she was a um, staff member at the alliance library system oh. mm -hmm. Very nice. she made uh, several donations to libraries and systems and ours was among them very nice. Any other questions for Jim um, at any of our other sites or on the phone? All right, then, may I have a motion for approval of the financial report for August of 2017? So moved. Thanks, Paul. And a second? I'll oh. second that. All right, thanks, Harriet.
Um, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. Um, Jim, always so surprising, I know. You are <laughs> up again for hey. the expenditures. At the, uh, at the end of the report is a listing of the checks and, and uh, vouchers for the month of August. And um, in the total amount of 1,462,882.63 dispersed, it's a bit over our normal 900 to 100,000 uh, uh, or 900,000 to 1 million a month. Uh, we have the um, capital expenditure check in there of 377,000, uh, which is the major inflator of that. Are there any questions? Uh, on the list. All right, hearing no questions, may I have a motion for approval of the check voucher register for August 2017 in the amount of $1,462,882.63? So moved. Thanks, Paul. And may I have a second? I'll second. Second. I'll Thanks, second Scott. Nadia. Oh. oh. <laughs> Next matter. time, Nadia. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Um, uh, roll call, please. Christine Barr. Yes. Sue Busenbark. Yes. Gwen Gregory. Yes. Kate Hall. Yes. Paul Mills. Yes. Scott Poynton. Yes. Nadia Shake. Yes. Michelle Simmons. Joe Skabinski? Harriet Zipfel. Yes. All right, motion carries. Thank you. Um, Jim, before you move too far away, do you want to just hang out there? Um, I'll have some materials. Oh, okay. I'll be back. He'll be back. So <laughs> next up is our audit. Um, and I'm wondering if um, Dan Byrne from Sickich is on the phone. Dan, are you with us? I am. Can ah. you hear me? We can hear you, so we're just going to wait one moment. Jim is getting some things, and then we'll turn it over to the two of you. Sounds good. I guess I can start. That sounds great. Um, in, in your packet is uh, our drafts of the um, Rails Annual Financial Report, complete with the audit uh, Opinions. It's an audit conducted by Sickage, and on the phone uh, today is Dan Burr, the partner um, on our audit. And there's also a single audit report, and you separately received the uh, auditor's communication to the board of directors, which basically summarizes how the audit went. If there was any uh, issues, um, which happily there were none, and. Um, Dan, can you take it from there then? Absolutely. Thank you, Jim. Uh, thank you for having me, and I appreciate the ability to call in too. I, uh, please feel free to interrupt if um, you have any questions at all or if you um, can't hear me for any reason that technology isn't working well. Um, I'm happy to report that the audit went off without a hitch. We received excellent cooperation from the rail staff, most especially from Sharon Swanson and Bill Getz and, and Jim Grigger as well. Um, we were able to begin our preliminary field work on schedule at, on uh, about mid-June and then come out for our final field work last day of July and wrapped it up uh, that week. We were able to get the draft of the financial statement out to Jim uh, exactly on schedule. Now we're able, because of that cooperation and, and excellent preparation for us, we're able to attend th this meeting and get you um, the drafts exactly on schedule. These drafts are all ready to go final upon approval by uh, um, management and the board. So um, we don't anticipate any changes whatsoever. Please let us know if you see any typos or anything. Um, the, the audit went so well, in fact, that we only had one journal entry, and that related to posting of the actuarial report effects uh, to the general ledger for IMRF. Um, so that was the only one. 
Uh, on page two of the annual financial report is the part of the uh, report that's truly ours, um, pages one through three, the opinion. Um, and we're happy to report that this is what's commonly referred to as a clean opinion. We call it an unmodified opinion. It's the best opinion we're allowed to give, and it's the same opinion you've received in the past from us. It simply says that the financial statements present fairly in all material respects, financial position, and results of operation. Well, that's, that's the best news we're allowed to give. If you haven't had a chance or, uh, to, to flip through the report and study it, um, please start with the management discussion and analysis that appears immediately after our opinion. It's at page number MDNA 1 through MDNA 8. It's a very nice synopsis written by Jim uh, of what happened this year and compared to last year. Gives you some nice um, explanations and analysis as well. Nice job on that, Jim. Um, Immediately following that are the meat and potatoes of the financial statements on page four, the statement of net position. And as Jim mentioned, we have uh, $16.5 million of cash investments there on a combined basis for the general and the uh, capital projects fund. We have almost $4 million of receivable, which inflates the fund balance because it's not, um, there's no offset to that. Immediately below that almost $4 million is, a, is an, uh, or two below it, is uh, the net pension asset. You're one of my few clients that are actually overfunded with IMRF. <laughs> so you have Just approximately $700,000 uh, in excess of what the actuaries say you need at IMRF. That is down um, from uh, the prior year by about $350,000. Last year it was about $1,030,000. So you are whittling it down somewhat by having lower um, uh, employer contributions than you normally would have. The results of operations uh, on the following page show that you had uh, a change in net position on page five of almost five million dollars to the negative. Um, yeah, uh, the government accounting standards course tells us that that is a measure of whether you're doing better economically and financially than prior years, so clearly you're whittling down your net position from $30.5 million to $25.5 million. Oh, Dan, can I just pause you for one minute? It sounds like we had someone join us on the phone. I'm sorry to interrupt. I, I, this is Michelle Simmons, and a meeting ran late, so I apologize for my tardiness. Oh, that is okay, Michelle. Welcome. We are just hearing the report from the auditor. So, sorry. Thanks, Dan. Thank you you so can much. continue. <laughs> Well, you joined at the wrong time. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so flipping over to page six is the balance sheet of the governmental funds, and there you find a page that's more familiar to most of you uh, because it's on a modified accrual basis. And there again, we see the due from other governments of nearly $4 million, but that is offset because uh, in deferred inflows of resources in the, uh, just below the liability section, by an unavailable grant revenue. And the reason we say it's unavailable is because it's outside, it has not yet been received, and the RAILS policy is that anything that hasn't been received within 60 days of year end is, is by definition unavailable to be spent. So we're not including that in the uh, fund balance below or as revenue. So if you go to the fund balance below, we have uh, prepaid items, of uh, nearly 700000 and an unassigned fund balance in the general fund of $12.3 million, and an assigned fund balance for the special projects and capital projects of $3.6 million. So if we flip back one, two more pages, the last page that I, I was planning to talk about is the um, change in fund balances page, and near the bottom of page eight, we see that the net change in fund balances is negative uh, $7,500,000. So the fund balances dropped from over $20.5 million down to uh, just over $13 million. Clearly, the, uh, the organization is spending down uh, the fund balance. 
Um, we also have the capital, we have not made a transfer from the general fund to the capital project funds this year, and uh, that reduced its fund balance by about 200000 and obviously that does not include uh, a lot of the project work that has been going on at the Burr Ridge location this summer. So that's all I wanted to talk about on the uh, financial statements themselves. Uh, is there any questions I can answer for you on this document? I just want to reiterate that there's a different state that was, you know, hang on, Jim. That, that was used to recognize the $4 million that's still outstanding. So for the statement of net position, which is a full accrual basis, the way we looked at it when we prepared that statement is that our revenue, this money was earned by us, and so we booked it as earned revenue. But for the governmental which is modified accrual, you have to, um, it has to be, what was that word for that? Uh, um, achievable or be recognizable, well, within that 60-day limit, you have available, that's what I was, so the revenue was not available within the 60 days, and so we had a much, we didn't recognize it as revenue, so that's why we have like a, a seven, 7.7 7 million decline in the government in the uh, general fund balance, but overall we had about a five million decline. So there is a distinction between the two. So I'm curious then for next year. Like, let's assume that tomorrow we get the payment um, that will be in this fiscal year, but it was for last. It'll be booked as year. revenue oh. in this fiscal year. The governmental fund okay and it won't have any impact on the statement of net position okay because it had been recognized as a okay all right and Correct. we're You're um, under sorry i was going to just say there's someone i think making there's some feedback rustling noise we're hearing on the phone i'm not sure um where it's coming from because we can't see you but if people could just be aware that we can hear it. Thanks. Sorry, Dan, please go ahead. So um, and on page uh, 28 is the um, uh, budget to actual, and it shows there that you had a budget of $5.8 million and an actual of $1.9 million uh, for the area per capita grant. That's the disparity there is due to the revenue recognition of, of nearly $4 million. Does that make right. sense? Mm -hmm. Okay. Any other questions or comments on the financials? If not, I'll jump over to the uh, uh, board communication. Um, this is the required board communication. In this document, generally speaking, no's are good. Uh, if, you, if you see the word no, it, it generally is a good thing for the uh, board. We're required to tell you if we had any problems, disagreements, difficulties, um, any adjustments. Um, and the answer to all those questions, with the exception of the adjustments, was no. We, and again, we only had one adjusting journal entry. So outstanding work by the uh, rail staff. And toward the back of it is our management letter. And we don't have any comments. There are either no material weaknesses, no uh, uh, significant deficiencies that were required to report to the board. And the only thing we talk about in there is upcoming uh, government accounting standards board's pronouncements that will need to be implemented in the future by the system. The last document is the single audit, the document that we're required to file with the federal government uh, when uh, an entity spends more than $750,000 in federal funds. And, uh, again, we're giving you a clean opinion on that, and we had no findings there either. So congratulations. Uh, as I said, these documents are ready to go final, and uh, we'll be issuing them as soon as we get the approval. So thank you very much, and I'd be happy to answer any questions about the process, about the documents you have before you, or anything else you have in mind. All right. Thank you so much, Dan. Um, I just want to also thank... Um, Jim and Sharon and the rest of the staff for their hard work on putting this all together and kudos on only one 
One journal entry. That's that's <laughs> very impressive. And that's a pension one, which yeah. virtually nobody has yeah. figured out. But yeah. our, our goal is that we will make that entry ourselves next year. No. This, this year we did the post-employment benefit okay. uh, entry, which Sickage had been doing also. Yeah. We figured that one out. So next year we're going for 100%. 100%. Okay. Well, just be warned, this is being recorded. So we're... <laughs> Right, well, does, I say it with confidence because yeah, Bill sure, already he, he retraced it and he figured out how oh. to do it. So I think we'll be okay. You've already figured, there you go. Well, um, does anyone have any questions for Dan? One final offer. All right, well then in that case, if I could have a motion and a, a second to accept the audit as presented. So moved. Thanks, Paul. Second. One. I'll second it, Nadia. Thanks, Nadia. <laughs> Great. How many, please? Um, <laughs> and Emily, could we please have a roll call vote? Christine Barr. Yes. Sue Busenbark. Yes. Gwen Gregory. Yes. Kate Hall. Yes. Paul Mills. Yes. Scott Poynton. Yes. Nadia Shake. Yes. Michelle Simmons. Yes. Harriet Zipfel. Yes. All right. Dan, thank you again for um, calling in and joining us today. We really appreciate it. I'm sure you would love to stick around, and you're welcome to do so. But if you also have other things, well, I hope you have a wonderful rest of your Friday. Actually, I'm in Appleton, Wisconsin today, so I, I'll be on the road. So. Okay. Well, safe <laughs> thank driving. Thank you very much. <laughs> right. And, thank and you please so much. give me a call if you have any questions at all. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much, Jim. You get to go. Now he can go and be out of camera sight. Um, <laughs> up next is the FY17 annual report, and Jane will present it to us. Yes. Uh, well, oh, hang on. Did, oh, it was Dan, right. Okay. Dan leaving. Right. Okay. That makes sense. <laughs> Sorry. Well, the audit is part of our annual um, report to the Illinois State Library. You have in your packet the rest of it which includes a narrative report uh, various tables and statistics as well so um, I guess I would just entertain any questions I don't have a question I just want to say though I think it's always incredibly um, helpful to see everything in one spot and realize just how much rail staff accomplishes every year. So I just want to say kudos on all of the work that was done. Um, this certainly is, I think, very impactful when you read it all like this because you realize that you're doing a lot, that you, rail staff, not me, that you guys are doing a lot, but when you see it all like this, it becomes even more amazing. So kudos and thank you for all of your hard work. Thank you, and it is helpful to look back and realize <laughs> what you have, in fact, accomplished. So. Yeah. Does anyone in Coal Valley have any questions for Jane? Um, any of um, our video conferencing sites? Which is basically Nadia. <laughs> um, or anyone on the phone? All right, well, in that case, may I have a motion to approve the report and submit it to the State Library for approval? So moved. Thank you, Harriet. And a second? Second. second. Thanks, Sue. Oh. Oh. Go ahead. So who just spoke? I couldn't tell who it was. Oh, was it Gwen. Michelle? Oh, oh Gwen. 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 Okay, excellent. Okay, we'll give the second to Gwen. And um, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Right, motion carries. Um, next up, we have some membership changes, and I'm going to ask Amanda if you would come up to the spot that Jim so recently vacated <laughs> in order to present those to us. Okay. On September 5th, I visited St. Mary's School in Sterling, and September 6th, I visited Comeric District 94 in Riverside, North Riverside, sorry and determine both of these school libraries meet Rails membership requirements. I would like to request 
the Rails Board of Directors vote to recommend to the Illinois State Library membership of both of these schools. Uh, St. Mary's grade school has quite a low materials budget. The size of the library um, seemed adequate, but um, the director mentioned that their budget was very low, so I asked exactly how low it was, and she said it was $500 a year, and that was an increase. So she um, has worked in the area at various schools, the public library and the two private schools for the last 44 years. So she has a very strong tie to the community, which is fortunate in that she knows the families and she's able to solicit a lot of donations of materials and supplies. So they're very fortunate in that way. So that um, makes up for a little bit of the lack of the budget. Um, she said that they have uh, programs that um, were offered during the summer, but they have not been well attended lately. So they had to cut back that. But um, during the school year, uh, they have some small book groups and other activities to get the students in the library. So it's, it's a very nice library. Um, Comeric District 94, on the other hand, they have a very, very strong budget. They, she said that they were given 4000 a year for materials. And then, but she said when that runs out, she asked the superintendent and principal for more money and they have never said no. So it's quite impressive. She said that she doesn't know exactly where the limit is, but <laughs> 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 she's not gonna. She hasn't found it yet. <laughs> right, 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 yes. So that's great. Um, she has only worked there for a little over a year and she's in the process of reorganizing the library. And after that, she's planning to expand programming with her almost unlimited funds. <laughs> 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 Um, upon membership approval, Rails is recommending that both of these school libraries join eRead Illinois and receive interlibrary loan training. <laughs> it right. sounds like um, they. It sounds like St. Mary's would also be a good, um, perhaps, point of contact for a multi-type library grant in yes. the future <laughs> with sure. um, Moline being right here. So, right, right, yes. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Right. Um, Any this, questions? Oh. oh. Anyone have any questions for Amanda? Oh, did we have someone who has just joined us? Or did we lose someone? Of course, they wouldn't respond if they left. <laughs> so, okay. All right. Um, so, hearing, hearing no questions, um, if I could have a motion to approve the recommendations as presented and request final approval from the Illinois mm -hmm. State Library. So moved. Thanks, Sue. And a second, please. I'll second. I'll, not, Nadia. <laughs> Thanks, Nadia. Um, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Great, motion carries. Thank you so much, Amanda. Uh, next up, we have our report section. I do not have a report today, so we will move right along to our committee reports. Um, Paul, anything from consortia? Um, the consortia committee will be meeting on Monday, October 16th, which is actually just a few weeks away. So that will be before the next October board meeting. So I will certainly um, share a report at that time. I would actually note that um, Rails board president Kate Hall uh, and myself and Ann Slaughter, who's in Bolingbrook, did attend the SWAN board meeting to have a conversation about uh, regional library system support for the LSAPs and also we had a conversation about the overlay project as well and I you know, anticipate we'll have a continued conversation on those topics at the consortia committee meeting on October 16th. Great, thanks so much Paul. Um, the delivery committee did not meet and the executive committee however did meet. Uh, we met to review the 24 applications we received for the soon to be vacant um, position because Harriet has decided that she wants to enjoy some fun leisure time and retire, which is completely fair. Um, so we are um, working on reviewing that and should have a recommendation for the full um, board at the October meeting. So stay tuned for that. Um, Laura is not here, but the policy committee has not met. 
Um, and Jane, anything for the System Membership Standards Committee? <coughs> uh, the committee has not met, nor is it scheduled to meet uh, in the foreseeable future. However, uh, the staff team that's working on the standards um, is continuing work. Uh, we uh, have developed a um, reasonably simple checklist um, for the standards uh, in a word version currently working on putting it into Adobe Acrobat um, the staff team are going to uh, touch base the middle of October and we're hoping to begin the um, the beta test so to speak um, sometime in November with a, with a group of libraries so great thank you very much um, would you like to keep going? Sure. <laughs> and go on to your report? Sure. Okay. Uh, well, as you and Jim mentioned, uh, and as I said before, we did get approval for our uh, area per capita grant application and uh, plan of service, so that was great news. Also, uh, just around lunchtime, I, uh, uh, we got the award letter for our market quality grant. Um, this is much smaller. It's just over $36,000. But that grant has paid for um, some processing uh, that assists the LSAPs in um, having their holdings batch loaded to OCLC. Mm -hmm. So it saves a considerable amount of staff time. So that was good news. Um, we are looking at what the future of that batch loading will look like as uh, the, the um, owners of the market quality company are planning to um, retire um, oh. after this year. So, uh, yeah, Deborah and Richard Fritz, some of you have worked with them. So. And so just for clarification to kind of explain a little, I mean, I know some of us will understand it better than, like, I have a general idea of what they do when they go in and they spread the records, but could you maybe explain just a little bit about what Mark of Quality does? Sure. Or is that Kendall? No. <laughs> no, I, I understand it, so that's fine. Uh, so what happens here, um, without this, uh, staff at individual libraries would need to go in to OCLC and mark what holdings they have or what holdings they've gotten rid of as they update what they own. Um, so to um, make that easier um, and reduce work at the library level, what's been going on since a long time has been that um, periodically uh, the LSAP staff will export the holdings uh, and send it to uh, the market quality, which is a two-person company, um, and they run it through some of their filters. They they take out records that are not going to um, match well at OCLC because it's all machine-based algorithms. Um, and they filter out so they can tell what are the new things and what are the holdings that have been deleted and merge that information and send it to OCLC. Thanks, Jane. Great. Any other? Um, also, as Jim mentioned, um, we passed our inspection at Burr Ridge and got our occupancy permit this week, so staff were informed this week that we could start using the renovated areas. I.e. the bathrooms yeah. and other areas. And the kitchen. And the kitchen. And the kitchen. <laughs> Pantry. <laughs> Pantry. Pantry to be official. Um, <laughs> it looks wonderful, and as I mentioned, uh, we're hoping as many of you can come um, to our board meeting there next month and get a tour and see the place. Um, another building related issue, um, we have had uh, one showing on Coal Valley. Um, we think there is some interest. We have not received any offers yet at all, but um, there does seem to be some interest in the building. Um, for those of you who are newer on the board, um, the, this building was on the market for three, four years. In fact, it was put on the market by Prairie Area Library System. Um, and when our contract with the realtor um, expired, we... I'm sorry. We're getting some feedback on the phone again. If someone is moving a lot near the phone... Thank you. Oh. oh. Nope. 
If you could just remember that we can hear you. It's quiet now. Thank you so much. Yeah. Sometimes what doesn't seem loud to you gets picked up by yes. the microphones. Yes, uh, it does. So the building was taken off the market for a while, and then we put it back on. So this is the first interest that we've seen since then. So uh, nothing definite yet, but uh, a little bit of interest. And even better, um, if there may be interest in leasing back the delivery area mm -hmm. um, to us, which is what we did with our wheeling building, and that worked out very well. Mm -hmm. so. Great. Any questions for Jane on her report? All right. Um, so the service and operations yeah, report. Any questions on the operational report? All right. Well, thank you so much, Jane. And we will turn it over to Deb, Karen, and Gwen at the State Library for their report. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, this is Deborah Aggard at the Illinois State Library, and I bring you greetings from Secretary of State Jesse White and Deputy Director Greg McCormick. As you already know, and I'm pleased to announce, uh, as of yesterday, an email and letter was sent to Dee, Kate, and Jane at Rails for the fiscal year 2018 system area per capita grant, $9,985,530. Hey! Yes. <laughs> <laughs> We are uncertain about the fiscal year 17 release of funding. The office is working on releasing a portion of the fiscal 18 from federal funding in mid-October. A number of grants have been released, like Jane had said, that impact Rails and its members. TMQ, the Project Next Generation, RIS, the Reader Information Services Grants, and delivery funding. The awards and notifications started to go out yesterday to member libraries that were um, awarded, and we've been getting back some nice thank yous. Family reading night posters and bookmarks have been mailed to the public library and schools statewide. As you remember, this had a hiatus for printing, so we were glad to reestablish that again. Letters about literature mailing will be going out shortly. And the fiscal year 2018 grant applications are underway. Most notably, the school grants that are due on October 15th. Look soon for the public library per capita grants, which will be due January 15th, 2018. And the Live and Learn construction grants will be coming soon. Are there any questions? Thank you so much, Deb. That's very exciting news, too, about the Family Reading Night publications. So, thank you. Thank you so much. All right, moving on to unfinished business. Uh, last month, we discussed the paid family leave policy, and there were some um, board members who expressed that they wanted some time to reflect on it, which is great. Um, we received some great questions from Paul, um, and those were sent out separately to you earlier this week um, for those. So I'd like to see if anyone has any questions or um, comments on either the questions or the updated policy. I have a question. In, in the very first paragraph, the last sentence of the first paragraph under paid family leave says this policy will run consecutively with any other benefit or leave time for which the employer requests and is eligible. Um, I think I understand the intent of that, but I don't think it's worded as wonderfully as it could be. Uh, are, are we saying that the paid family leave and FMLA leave will be concurrent or not? consecutive so in a row. yes so so it would be the six weeks of paid family leave 
the FMLA would not be triggered until after the six weeks was met, and then they would have a remaining 12 weeks, which per the FMLA policy stipulates that it is unpaid, but then they would still have, if they so choose and wanted to take more time, have their regular vacation and sick time, which they could take for that. So the six weeks would be outside of the 12 weeks. So it would be the, the potential would be for a total of 18 weeks. If I'm Mm -hmm. and, and how are we handling FMLA currently? Are they, is it concurrent with sick time or not? It is. It is. Yes. And so that is a policy that um, Dee had, ar had already noted that we needed to update. Um, she knows that we need to update that portion of... She wants um, to change that one to match this wording. To match this. And that is something that we're aware of. The reason for this is because we do um, Rails... There are two Rails staff members who are... Um, reaching leave time very soon so right. well it, and well that's an interesting uh, point kate that you made i would assume you know prior to this policy being brought to the board there were also other staff members who were probably in a situation where the, this type of leave would have been beneficial so yeah, i guess that kind of comes back to a concern i got over timing what's triggered it that you know it, you know, certainly we care about all our staff, we care about our staff, you know, I'm equally. So my, I guess I'm a little confused about the timing. Well, I mean, I know we, we started talking about this last spring, maybe even earlier. When did Barb leave? June. June. And so we, the policy committee had had one meeting maybe in April or May. I want to say, I can't remember the exact timing, to talk about this. Um, and then um, after that, then Barb's departure, this was tabled, rightfully so. Um, and then um, I don't believe that it was known at that time that this was imminent. I believe that that became apparent, like they, that Rails is informed. I'm not 100% sure, though. Um, and that this was a part of an overall plan based on the sick leave policy um, with Cook County and that that kind of triggered a whole review of a number of different policies and examining it and that this was part of that. But then why we're looking at it now is because of Barb's departure and the restructuring and tabling that. And then with the new board coming on, it didn't make sense to try and cram it in before the end of the fiscal year. So I don't know if that helps at all with the timeline for things and kind of what, and that's what I recall. If anyone else calls differently, my brain does not always remember all of the, all of the details, but. I'm not sure timing rule. I mean, it has to yeah. be done. So if it's done now or if it's what, I don't understand why there's an issue of doing it now or tabling it. And it's an, I think maybe like if an employee or employees in the last say two years could have really benefited from this, okay, and then they didn't, and then now this is put into place, and some employees immediately can benefit from it. It's a, a little rough. <laughs> well, I understand that, but that's kind of the way it is. And with any pol I mean, any policy. I mean, you know, you tuition reimbursement, like to, you know, now they're they're wavering college tuitions well we we all paid our college tuition but now now it's <laughs> going to be <laughs> taken care of you know it's just i mean it's just mm -hmm. it's something that happens is there a philosophical reason i keep coming back to this one point but a philosophical reason why we want the, this benefit to be consecutive to other benefits as, as opposed to concurrent Part yeah. of the part of the issue now is is that um, employees are actually uh, required to use all of their benefit time, not only sick leave but also sure. yeah. vacation leave and personal leave. So, for example, if if uh, someone does take that off or um, use up all their time for parental leave, and then still, you, you know, babies get sick or need wellness checks or whatever, they have no, nothing left, no time left. 
And the other, I think, philosophical point on this is that um, Rails, in seeking to be a leader in um, library systems nationwide and for setting examples for our member libraries as well, um, this is something that is more generous than what we typically, I think, have become accustomed to um, in this country in libraries. But realistically, 12 weeks of um, either partially paid or fully paid or unpaid time is not really a whole lot when you're dealing with significant health issues, whether it be the birth of a child, caring for, um, you know, a parent or someone else in your family with a serious health condition. There's a lot of different scenarios here. I know we always use pregnancy because it seems like the easiest one. Um, and I think that in order to hire and retain really strong staff, being aware that their life does not stop and start at rails and that they have potentially um, things that will happen to them um, and that rails can do something to retain those really good employees when they are going through those times. I think that is what this policy speaks to. It speaks to recognizing that the retaining people isn't just giving them a paycheck, although that I know is important. So, uh, you know, but that this is about pr creating a culture and um, sending a message about how Rails feels about their staff. And yes, there are some staff that will never use this. Um, but for the staff that do, the impact that a policy like this will have on their lives and not having to worry about it is tremendous and you know I have two staff members that are that recently just had babies in like the last couple months one of whom came back after eight weeks because that was the amount of time she had saved up and it saddened me so much that she had to come back when she was not you know perhaps a hundred percent ready to come back because she had to do that in order to support you know get her paycheck and this would provide more cushion. And so that, that I think is also where, you know, when it was presented and kind of how, what Dee had talked about when we looked at it at the policy committee. And uh, this is Nadia on the line. Nadia, yeah. And I just wanted to reiterate, I mean, if you want to retain the best possible staff, you have to send a message. And I think this sends a very loud <clears throat> and clear message to our staff that we value them. We value what they do, not just for, you know, Rails as an institute, but for all the member libraries. And I would like um, what Dee had mentioned, at, Deirdre had mentioned at one of my, my first board meetings, is that we want to be the best library system. So I think this demonstrates that we are the best. We're up and coming with the times. If other... Uh, organizations are hiring pregnant women, I think we should definitely not um, limit them to, okay, you're going to take your six, six weeks leave and you're going to come back to work and you're not mentally or physically prepared to do that. Let's, let's be realistic about um, <sighs> what it takes to recuperate from, whether it's a childbirth or a major surgery. Um, I, I have two young kids myself, and I know I would not be ready to go back to work within six weeks. And had, had my employer offered 12 weeks, I probably would have stayed. So this is just my two cents, and um, I am hoping that the rest of the board would agree that this is a fair uh, proposal. Thanks, Nadia. And so Paul, I see you have something, but Harriet had her hand up. Harriet, did you have a yeah, comment or question? Yeah, I was just question? wondering, in corporate America, is this, or is this what we're seeing happening in corporate America? Yes. Yeah, who said yes? Yeah, Nadia, Nadia did. Who, yeah. Okay. I, I, I had a conversation that, with uh, somebody recently who said that we just hired a pregnant woman, and uh, it, people did not think twice because she was so talented, and that why should that be a deterrent? To an organization, for, also it's not legal to not hire right. pregnant women. You know, <laughs> right, <but laughs> so let's just not frown upon that. And it's like you are of you know a childbearing age, and 
employers unfortunately look at you like, okay, you're going to be going on maternity leave soon. No, that's not the case for everybody. And, you know, I think had um, Rails instituted this earlier, yes, a lot of other employees would have benefited, perhaps. I don't know, you know, I'm, I'm fairly new to the board. But this is a policy now, and I think it's wrong of us to keep pushing it, especially when you have two people who are very close to needing to use the benefit. Okay. I, I just wish that when I was pregnant, I would have been able to have a period of time like this. I went back to work after three weeks, and one of those weeks was in the hospital, so um, 12 weeks would have definitely been, been nice to have. Well, and, from personal. and even just outside of the pregnancy piece, like when my father was dying of cancer and I was, you know, trying to get work done and I was going back and forth and I, I could have taken unpaid time and I could have, it would, you know, it would have made it a lot easier. easier. Yeah. Yeah. So. And unfortunately, have women have to put up with it more. <laughs> you know? Yeah. It's pertinent. Yeah. Do we have any questions or comments on the phone? Is everyone still on the phone? I just want to make sure. Yes, I'm still here. This is Chris. Oh, good. Okay. <laughs> we must have lost Michelle. I'm okay. still here. This Did is we... Michelle. Okay, great, Michelle. <laughs> okay. Um, so does anyone have any questions or, or, you know, Scott raised the clarification question about the consecutively. Um, any other clarification questions about the wording in the policy? Paul? Yes, I would actually like to revisit um, one of the questions I asked, and there was an answer provided. Um, the first one actually would be um, under the amount, time frame, and duration of paid family leave, the first point. I, you know, I'd indicated that I thought there needed to be some criteria for the executive director, um, because you are in this policy treading on Family Medical Leave Act, and I'm, I am afraid that if we put um, our management team in a position with this policy without giving some guidelines, we're opening them up to actionable positions. So I think at a minimum, there would need to be some language in here that would indicate that in this, in, in this scenario that might happen, that uh, the appropriate parties would need to in engage in uh, using the key words that you see in a lot of lawsuits, an interactive process um, for determining that. Because that has always seemed to have been the key to put the employer in a good position um, in case there are disputes. Is that not, I thought that was usually just with ADA. I uh, and I've, it, be, I, with FML, I've seen that. I think it's key. Okay, I'm not it's keys, and, and I, think if, I think if that is put into policy, you provide, you put the institution in a much better place and it makes it clear that it's an expectation of the organization that an interactive process would be engaged in. So where would you like to see that placed in the actual policy? Probably in that, there's, so you've got the section where it starts, um, where's the section? I apologize. I'm looking for the section yeah, where it talks about where the executive director will, um, for consideration. The employee Probably. may submit yeah. a separate request for additional paid leave to the executive director. Yeah. For consideration. For consideration. So maybe you have a second sentence that says, you know, the executive director or appropriate designee will engage in an interactive process to determine. I think it's clear that, you know, it, it, you have much more favorable outcomes if it shows that there was a, a conversation that occurs. Mm -hmm. Okay. May I ask a question, Kate? Of course. I have a question. Uh, so, uh, Bef when an employee does request a sick leave or family leave, is the chain of command to go th through the immediate supervisor or first contact HR and then the executive director? How does that work? Good question. Well, currently with when FMLA is needed, um, which any time a employee is gone for more than three days so on the fourth day uh, the employee or supervisor should notify HR so that process can be put into place paperwork filled out so 
um, yeah, the supervisor is aware that HR typically handles. But the for like, are processes. you talking about just like short term use? Like, I'm taking a week off. Uh, or like are short you term and long term. term. I'm just curious what the chain of command is, just in general. Like, if someone's taking a day off, that wouldn't go oh, through. Oh, that that yeah. No, someone but like, oh, let's say a, let's yeah. say six weeks. You know, that would go through immediate supervisor, and then they would take it to HR. Yes, but both. I mean, we work closely okay. together, so certainly the, the immediate supervisor would be informed, but HR would be involved right away as well. Okay. I think often at my library, I know it kind of depends on who the employee goes to first. Some will go to their immediate supervisor, some will go straight to HR. Yeah. So it's kind of a, all parties become aware, but not necessarily in the same order every time. <laughs> so, um, Other wording questions or... Um, changes that people feel need to be made to how things are? Um, well, it's, it's not a wording question, but I guess this is more of a question for Jane. But um, So it, the 12 weeks of FMLA plus the six weeks proposed here is 18 weeks. It's four and a half months plus any personal or vacation time they might also have, in theory, can be tacked on at some point there. So is there... This could be any, almost any position in the organization. I mean, are there, well, how, how do we weather the storm of someone being gone, uh, you know, four and a half months or well, five months? Well, as I mentioned in the, in the written answer, it really, yeah, it's, it's, it really depends on the position. Um, because obviously if it's a position like delivery, that job has to be done. So um, typically we use the some temporary employees, uh, which we do a lot for delivery anyway, um, to, to fill in either hiring them on our own or using an agency. Uh, other positions, we've just like had other people assume responsibilities. For example, we were without a magic director for over <laughs> a year, um, and Ann Slaughter capably filled in with that, and that was because things you know, we were exploring the future of magic at that point sure. with them. So it really depends, but we have we have managed. All right. Did you have? I know you had mentioned earlier uh, some additional st yeah. staff. Potential. Yeah. As we, as we were looking through this and, and answering Paul's questions, I have a couple of small wording changes, which I did suggest uh, in the written answers as well. So. Um, under qualifying criteria relationship, uh, third bullet point, it currently says be a spouse or committed partner. Uh, we think be a spouse or domestic partner um, would be better since we have used domestic partner in other policies, so just for consistency. And then um, same section, second bullet point, um, from the end, members of your household include those who live with you all year. Uh, rather than saying all year, we would recommend changing that to as their permanent <coughs> residence. Okay. Um, are there any additional questions either concerning the specific policy wording or the policy in general. I, um, hearing none, then I would ask for a motion to approve the policy as amended with Jane's and Paul's um, changes. I'll make the motion. Oh, okay. Well, um, Nadia and then Sue, did you want a second? Yes. Okay. I didn't mean to. She had spoken at the same time. <laughs> Wasn't trying to assign Our seconds. <laughs> yes. Um, and Emily, could we do a roll call? Sure. Christine Barr. Yes. Sue Busenbar. Yes. Gwen Gregory. Yes. Kate Hall. Yes. Paul Mills. Yes. Scott Poynton. Yes. Nadia Sheik. Yes. Michelle Simmons. Yes. 
Harriet Zipfel. Yes. Great. Well, thank you guys very much. And the policy committee, I know, um, will be looking forward to additional policies coming forth in the coming months so that we can clean up um, some other ones so that we are consistent across the board. <laughs> so, um, And the staff thanks you as well. <laughs> uh, so up next, we have the overlay project. And so there was a draft of um, some questions that we had received largely from the consortia committee um, with answers that Jane provided. Um, there is some verification needed, so it was asked that those not be shared just yet. We're waiting to hear, Jane was waiting to hear back um, from Autographics, who was the, is the recommended overlay um, vendor. So, um, and Jane can give an update on that. Right. As I mentioned, I wanted you to see this because uh, it was a lot to uh, take in, uh, and the project has has been uh, been going on in, in various phases uh, for four years. So uh, I'm very familiar with it, but obviously not everybody is. Uh, I have sent, the, especially the more technical pieces, to Autographics and asked them to verify it. I'm I'm quite confident in most of the answers, but there are a few things I want, want them to check on. I've also asked some uh, other rail staff to review it as well and um, to see if they've heard of any other questions. Um, so I would ask you as well, do you have any other questions? Are there things that were not clear? I would like to thank Jane for putting this together. It's been a long-standing uh, topic, and I think Jane's document was really well done. Thank you, Paul. <laughs> summarizes everything very, very nicely. So, um, as Paul mentioned, uh, you know, uh, we will be taking this to the consortia committee on October 16th, um, and then I um, anticipate having it on the board agenda, um, hopefully if, as an action item next month. So that's why I wanted to see you to see this as well at this point. So. And once the um, information has been verified by Autographics, we'll be sharing this with the people who um, ask the questions as well as posting it on the Rails website. So in some um, form or some fashion, form, right? yeah, Mary and I need to talk about that. Okay. We think it's you know a little um, text dense to just put it up there on the, on the website, but it will mm -hmm. be available um, to the consortia committee. I will also send it out to um, uh, certainly Prairie Cat and Rock River uh, and the Carly folks. Um, as additional information for them um, initially. Um, I'm also going to the Libris group, which is a group of 18 ac uh, private academic libraries uh, in the Chicago area. I'm talking to them on October 18th. Um, they have expressed interest, um, and I've heard of interest from um, some other libraries um, as well. So. Uh, we do know that not all of our libraries are in favor of this project, but we do know that th there are libraries that are definitely very um, interested in it and see it as a way to uh, expand resource sharing. So, great. Thanks, Jane. Uh, any questions for Jane? All right, well, we look forward to talking about this yeah. again <laughs> next month. <laughs> so, um, and Jim. You are up next. If you wouldn't mind joining us up here, Jim is going to be reviewing uh, financial processes and internal controls. How timely with the audit just being completed. <laughs> and since we know we already received excellent marks. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, there were no there have been no <laughs> internal control findings in the time I've been here. Um, <clears throat> basically, I'll tell you how we're organized and what we do, and then a little bit about internal controls and, and the theories behind it and, uh, and how we um, prevent uh, um, lapses in our controls and, and uh, things like Dixon that everybody refers to as the ultimate uh, um, example of a lack of internal controls. 
Um, at Rails, we have a staff uh, in a finance department. We have a staff of five people. I had that as well as human resources now. Um, we have two accountants, staff accountants. One uh, does primarily does the accounting and the um, journal entries for the Rails operation, and Sharon over there uh, handles all the LSAP. So our finance department not only does the accounting for Rails, it does the accounting for Swan, Magic, RSA, and and uh, Art and um, Prairie Cat. And um, even though these are many of these are in remote locations, it works fine. So um, Sharon is a person who coordinates all the audits and uh, and monitors the general ledger and makes sure all the entries go in. Um, on top of that, we we do all the billing for. Rails and Swan, and one person does that. That's Deborah Mitcher, and uh, so she'll prepare all the uh, billings that we need to. Rails has a lot of billings for um, when we do group purchases, primarily, and the E-rate uh, program is where our billings come from. Uh, the LSAP billings are primarily the uh, member fees, which can be billed annually, quarterly. They're usually or monthly. So we have uh, Deborah does all that. Um, we then we have a separate person who uh, pays the bills, and that's uh, Jean Johansson, whom many of you know. Bill payer is a very important person, <laughs> um, but Jean will um, get the request uh, for payment, uh, be they expense reimbursements or uh, many bills are now mail, are mailed directly to her, uh, utility bills and ongoing bills, and then other. Uh, um, things will originate from the either the LSAP or Rails, and uh, with a request to pay it, and she'll uh, get these requests and make sure they're they're documented, uh, they're properly approved, and she'll put them into a check batch. And then um, finally, there's me, and I oversee all this, so I get involved in all these processes. But the basic way is I review everything that goes into the uh, books of the uh, of, of the uh, LSAPs or or Rails, our general ledger, and so I will see all these entries, and I will be the one who posts them. So you have two people looking at everything at a minimum. So <clears throat> the um, so separation of duties is a very important concept on internal controls, and by having all of us do different things. But also, we're pretty well cross-trained. Uh, Sharon could do much of the work that Bill does. Um, um, oh, yeah, on cash receipts, um, several of the accountants, nobody, uh, Deborah does not. She does the billing, but a separate accountant will record the cash receipt coming in. So she can't bill something and record a receipt coming in and pocket it or anything like that. So, so the... Uh, Basic uh, concept of separation of duties is that there's there's uh, no one conducts a process from start to finish or handles the books from start to finish. There's other hands involved, um, and so as I said, we have separate people preparing billings, uh, making payments, cash receipts, and general ledger, and and I do most of the uh, review and approval process. And just one. One example is on when we pay bills, what happens with that. So as I mentioned, uh, Jean will get the bills, she'll receive the invoices, check the documentation, and she'll put them in a batch for payment. And then that comes to me, so I review all that documentation. I make sure everything is in that batch and it's supported. I look at the, um, the journal, the entries for where it's going to be charged. Make sure we're charging it to the proper budget account, and then um, then I will go ahead and post this entry, and I will run the checks, and then they go to um, Deidre and in some cases uh, Paul Mills or Ann or Kate uh, as a second signature. So one person is looking at these bills and preparing for payment. Another person is is reviewing them and posting them. And then as many as two other people are involved in signing the checks. So you have several people seeing what's 
what's going out. And um, so that's, that's what this separation of duties is about. And employee expenses are subject to the same basic procedures. We, uh, any reimbursement forms, we uh, are approved by a supervisor before they even get to Gene. And, uh, and then I see them also. Um, let's see, what else? And uh, another point I want to make on separation of duties, and uh, this, is, this involves cash, you know, and you've seen a lot of um, instances or read about them where an employee uh, has misused cash or billed themselves or set up their own corporation to receive payments and things like that. Um, virtually everything, um, everything that Rails receives as funds, uh, we don't touch it because it goes to a lockbox. Virtually all the money that comes into us has been billed by Deborah and recorded by somebody else's receive. But the billings uh, direct the, um, the person making the payment to send money to a lockbox. So it does not go through Rails. We never see it. We never have an opportunity to touch any cash. And uh, I've always regarded that as a very important procedure. We have minimal amounts of cash that do come in, and usually they're checks that are mailed to rails for reimbursements of, uh, of over billing on insurance or things like that. And in the past, the talking books uh, um, uh, donations, which are going to go away. Those were a few thousand a year, but it's really minimal uh, compared to the total amount of money that we get. And um, so it, that really minimizes any opportunity for anybody to abscound with funds uh, of doing that. Um, I think that's uh, pretty much what I can talk about that. Uh, and I think I was talking. Sharon, am I missing anything? You're the major points, Jim. <laughs> okay. All righty. And I was talking to Jim earlier, and I think this is just an important point to note that um, none of the checks are stamped or preprinted. Everything is signed by an actual person. So there is, you know, when he's saying that like Paul or DRI is signing, it's not just stamping our names. It's we are actually looking at things and signing them, which I think is a really important, um, as Jim said earlier, part of the process. Um, and also reminded me that I think that Dee has mentioned this, but since you were talking about reimbursements, just as a reminder that Rails board members can receive reimbursements for travel from um, Rails for coming to the meetings, like if you come to Coal Valley, <laughs> Sue and Paul and Scott. So. Um, so Jim, thank you. That was okay. very thorough. Actually, before if yes, Jim, before you leave, you know, one thing is it's a point you noted. Um, Rails and similar organizations that do have uh, the benefit of having you know multiple staff members makes it easier for those separation you know duties and whatnot. Right. Um, I wonder if there is not. I guess I'm going to look at Joe too. If there's not a continuing education opportunity here with like either the Illinois GFOA. <gasps> Or something like that that was geared towards libraries that don't. Oh, I just wrote that uh, down too. Psychic. Sorry. Uh, that, 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 <laughs> that, that just don't, and I, I know many libraries like this that don't have the ability to have multiple staff there, which makes those controls tougher. If there are, mm -hmm. you know, best practices or recommendations, mm -hmm. I think that would be a great program. Hint, hint, wink, wink. Nudge, nudge. Nudge, nudge. <laughs> Yes. Yeah, I, and that reminds me, one point that I wanted to make that, you know, with us doing the um, LSAP accounting, if they were doing that separately, they would not be able to have nearly that type of advantage in their accounting, uh, nor probably the expertise that they have. So it's it's been a very, I think, a very valuable service that we've offered to them and, and that we do. Yeah. And those audits are go just like the ones for rails. So there's there's never any real issues on them. They go very smoothly. Does anyone have any other questions for Jim or comments? I have a comment. Oh. Um, in addition to the expertise of our finance staff, we um, appreciate their interest in rails and our libraries they are not just being counters they are very engaged with our services 
excellent point. Yes. Yeah, we're all going to the ILA conference. Excellent. Well, we'll look forward both, to seeing uh, you at the booth. Both uh, all our finance people and the uh, HR people are going. Great. Sure. Well, Jim, thank you very much. We'll thank look forward to all of us going to ILA to seeing you guys there. All right. Now we have an opportunity if any board members have news about their libraries that they would like to share. <laughs> no. <laughs> well, we're doing a library this card sign-up month. Oh, sorry. Yeah, no, Michelle, go ahead. Okay, Michelle. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. Um, I just wanted to um, let people know um, that Larissa Good at Warren County Public Library is working on a proposal um, regarding the unserved population, um, and um, she, uh, I know that we've uh, spoken with Dee about this before, um, that uh, she is going to be writing up a proposal that then Dee can use um, for um, work with uh, the unserved population that she has been um, pursuing. So I just wanted to let you know that that's in process. I actually have it in front of me right now, um, and I'm giving her a little bit of feedback, and she should have it in relatively soon. Well, great. That's very exciting. Thanks, Michelle. We'll look forward to seeing that. Great. Um, Thank you. Yeah, I was going to say that um, we all know that September is library card sign-up month, and we did. We went uh, some extra steps this year. Um, we're having gift baskets, and if people show their library card, they get entered into the raffle for the gift baskets. Uh, all overdue fines have been waived. So people are welcome to come in and start using their library again. They're not waived for lost items, but for but for the overdue fines. And if they don't already have a library card, come in and register, and they get into that gift basket giveaway. Um, if you lost your card, then you get to get a replacement for free. And... Um, we instigated a new three-day grace period for overdue items that starts that started at the beginning of this month, and so we're and then we've also gone out into the community quite a bit to sign up, sign people up for library cards. So it's been successful. Probably the the biggest surprise was how many lost items were returned to us. In our book. <laughs> no kidding. Magic. Yeah, that was magic. <laughs> Now, do these gift baskets have chocolate in them? You know, I don't know if they do or not. They probably do. What would it be if the library? Well, I mean, I'm wondering chocolate. if I should move to Galesburg. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> so, um, I don't have an announcement about my library, mm -hmm. but I um, do have a personal announcement, and that is the Kathy Parker, who used to be on the Rails board, um, and I are very excited. We're going to be doing an ALA webinar series this November um, called Library Director Boot Camp, Getting the Skills You Need. And we will be doing a three-part series, um, an hour and a half each, and trying to cover all of the basics for someone who either wants to be a library, public library director or has just become one, or if you want to just brush up and make sure you're not missing anything. Um, we're going to be covering personnel, buildings, insurance, finance, um, although not nearly as well as Jim, um, as well as a number of other issues. So if you're interested, you can check it out on the ALA website. I know Rails has graciously said they're going to help um, sh spread the word as well. But we're very, very excited about doing this. So um, that was all I had. Does anyone else? Any final well, I did mention last time that Congresswoman Sherry Bustos yes. was coming, and she did. Yes. And um, she brought along with her a um, big box of surplus books from the Library of Congress, which she um, gave to our library. And um, she graciously entertained questions. We had um, our mayor was there, city manager was there, some council people were there, um, superintendent of schools was there. So she entertained a, a wide field of questions, and um, it was a really nice. It was a really nice. It was a really nice thing. Yep. That's fantastic. I'm glad that it went so well. Good. That's wonderful. So. Any other news? <clears throat> 
Okay, well, um, agenda building for next month. Um, we are meeting on Friday, October 27th, which I believe there was one year we actually, it was Halloween. Maybe that was a delivery committee meeting where I got to come to the meeting dressed up. <laughs> but we're a little bit early for that. So it'll be Friday, October 27th at Burr Ridge. Um, all board members are invited and encouraged to attend in Burr Ridge um, for lunch and a tour of the newly renovated spaces. As we learned, the occupancy permits have um, allowed us to now use the bathroom, right? That's what I think yeah. is most exciting. I haven't seen them yet, but I'm really excited to see the bathrooms. Um, and staff from other Rails facilities um, will be invited. And we will hopefully be talking about the overlay again. Um, but are there any other agenda items for the next meeting? Committee charges. Committee charges. Thank you. Yes. We had talked about this last month. and. Thank you, Jane. Um, we'll be looking at those and have asked the committee chairs to please look those over with your committees and make sure that they're accurately reflecting the work that the committee is doing. So we'll be looking at that next month. Any other agenda items for next month? No? Well, then, with that, I am going to declare that this meeting is adjourned at 2.26 p.m. I hope everyone has a wonderful weekend and a safe drive home if you have traveled.